Does anybody remember our main verse that we started off with? And I said it's kind of our theme verse dealing with temptation. Very good. And so if temptation is a major struggle in our life, if it's something that as believers we're going to have to, to deal with and combat and, and have to worry about as far as uh, giving some attention to it, then we need to know what the Bible teaches about it. So here in Luke chapter 4 we have the Lord Jesus Christ who is tempted. And it's not God that's tempted, it's the man Christ Jesus. You have to understand Jesus is 100% God and He's 100% man. God cannot be tempted with evil, James chapter 1. But Jesus Christ as the man Christ Jesus is tempted and tested. So He goes through everything that we go through. The Bible says He was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. So when you go through a struggle or you go through a trial, you can look back to Jesus Christ who went through that same struggle and trial and you can gain strength because He passed the test. I'm glad somebody passed the test. Amen. And so we have a great example, we have a great high priest, we have a great elder brother, we have a great apostle and high priest of our profession, and he passed the test. He got in the ring with the devil and he knocked him out. And so here in Luke chapter 4 we read about it, verse number 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. In those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made of bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for season. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege to open up the Bible. It's a great honor to have the privilege to preach, the privilege to listen to preaching. And God, we pray the Holy Spirit of God would take the Word of God and do a work in our hearts. Lord, help us to get some instruction that may help us to live a life that's pleasing unto you, Lord, for our good and for your glory. And Father, we are way better off when we serve you and we do right and we win in temptation. And God, we know that Jesus is glorified through our life. And I pray, God, you'd help us in this time. God, use the Word of God to help us with the Holy Spirit of God. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. You know, we've made some, in, some decisions, hopefully, made some intentions and some resolves. Maybe you're determined after the preaching last night, after the preaching this morning. Good intentions alone will not get the There's many a Christian out there that's made some resolutions. Maybe the new year comes and they turn over a new leaf and they make a resolution and they have all the intentions of the world on doing right on quitting this bad thing over here. You know, you can't start something good until you quit some things that are bad. People don't like to talk about that. All they want to do sometimes is just focus on the good. Well, how can you focus on the good when you're so still filled with the bad? You've got to stop some things before you can start, start some things. And so a lot of times, Christians, they never get to the place beyond good intentions. We have to have more than just good intentions. The brother preached this morning, Brother Jay preached, and he preached that some Christians are backslid because of ignorance. I genuinely believe that some Christians, even some of these out here, and I'm not making an excuse for sin, but I'm telling you this, people that haven't had the preaching you've had. There are some young ladies that haven't been told about sin. You say, yeah, they have the Holy Spirit, they should know better. Yeah, you should read your Bible too. There's some things you should do, but you don't do either. But you have to realize some Christians, because of ignorance, 
The Holy Spirit has not convicted them like He might have you. We have this Bible and the Holy Spirit takes the Bible when you hear it preached and He convicts you and He wakes up your senses. Some people are ignorant. I want to submit to you, maybe even we are ignorant on some of these things. And so when we deal with temptation, we have ignorance and we don't have knowledge. Therefore, we fall. We're not ready. You know, temptation is inclusive. In other words, everybody in here will be included. You will be tempted. Temptation is also individual. There is a temptation that's got your name on it. The devil knows it. The world's out there for the devil to manipulate and use it. And there's a temptation with your name on it. And these three temptations, all temptations that you will encounter, are encompassed in these three main temptations. You find them in Genesis 3, 1 John 2. I quoted the passage last night. Uh, brother preached on it this morning. He quoted the passage. It goes right in line with what we've been preaching. Genesis chapter number 3, you can notice as we kind of work through these, think about it for a minute. The devil says, look, why don't you just turn the stones to bread? What did the devil tell Eve in the Garden of Eden? He was telling her about the fruit and she saw that it was good for food. What does the Bible say in 1 John 2.15? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Okay, then we have over here, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Maybe he used virtual reality. I don't know what kind of technology he used, but he had the ability to show him everything instantly. And he saw it with his eyes. Eve saw the fruit before she ever touched it. She saw the fruit before she ever tasted it. Before you think something wrong, you've got to see it. You've got to be presented with it. And so we have the temptation where things are pleasant to the eyes and it's the lust of the eyes. You can look at something with your eyes and you can think things that are wrong without ever doing the action. You can look at a car and say, man, I sure would like that car. Look at that car. That's a nice car. And you're not going to be able to buy that car, but you can covet that car. Now one day it may lead to an action where you steal somebody's keys and you go and steal that car. But the lust of the eyes is a dangerous thing. And that's the second temptation Jesus Christ is presented with. Then he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. He says, jump off the temple. If you jump off the temple, you know what's going to happen. Then the devil quotes the Bible. The angels are going to come down, and then you're going to have a pre-second coming. You're going to come down with the angels just like it's prophesied, and everybody's going to see you. They will know you're starting your ministry. They will know you're the Son of God, not just the Son of Man. So what he's doing is he's doing exactly what he did to Eve. He said, Eve, don't you need an upgrade? I mean, you know, there's some gods around here and higher education will bring you up a level. You know, well, why do you want to settle with small? Why don't you make it medium or large? Let's upsize it. Let's upgrade it. Let's step above. And he tried to, she fell down by trying to go up. You want to get close to God, you got to get down. You want to get something from God, you got to give something up. You want to gain, you've got to lose. You want to have victory, you must be defeated personally. It's a paradox in the Christian life. And we're going to see that as we work through these things. So tonight, I want us to focus on this because it deals with appetite. The first, these are three main temptations and all of them can fall into these categories. It deals with appetite, ambition, and applause. And here we have the lust of the flesh. So for this temptation as we deal with it, I want us to go to Genesis 39. This will serve as our illustration. Genesis chapter 39. This is Joseph in the Old Testament. Genesis 39. What is happening with the temptation of turning the stones to bread? The devil's basically saying, look, Jesus, you've been out here for 40 days and 40 nights, and you know everybody knows you're the Son of Man because you're here and you're a man, but if you're the Son of God, why don't you just, you got the power to do this, turn the stones to bread. Do what they did in the wilderness and get some manna. Do what God's going to do in the tribulation and take that white stone and turn it into bread. You know, turn some stones into bread. You can do it. You don't have to have God to do it. Just go ahead and act independently of God and please your flesh. This matches the temptation here in Genesis 39 with Joseph. And you know the story and we'll look at it in a second. When Potiphar's wife tries to get Joseph to commit adultery with her, he says this, he says, I can't do this wickedness and sin against God. You know what happens when you give in to your appetite, which is the lust of the flesh? When you give in to your flesh, 
you're moving away from God's will. You're acting independently of what God wants for your life. Listen to me. God has given us legitimate appetites and illegitimate appetites. You've got to know the difference. The world doesn't have any difference. They think if it feels good, do it. If you like it, enjoy it. If that's what you want to do with your life, do it. No God, no Bible, no Holy Spirit, no church council, no godly council. If it feels good, do it. Who cares what God says? You're hungry? Get something to eat. You want some sugar? You want two ice cream cones? Eat them, amen. <laughs> Brother, I had to throw you under the bus, man. <laughs> just, just do it. Appetite. Now look over here in Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Notice here with Joseph, you know the story of what happens. He is brought down to Potiphar's house. He's been sold as a slave. And his brothers had sold him down to the Ishmaelites and they had sold him over. Notice in verse number 7. He, you know, he was the manager of everything in Potiphar's house. The Bible says it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. I want to submit to you this idea of temptation here as we get into this passage. If you'll back all the way up to verse number 6. Here you are, you're trying to do what's right, you're serving God. Notice in verse number 6, God is blessing Joseph here. God is blessing Joseph. He left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Notice in verse number 5, He blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. When God works for you, the devil will work against you. That's the first thing. So if we put this up here, we can say, God is for you, the devil is against you. You have to understand when you deal with temptation, thank God God is for us. And you think about the heroes of the faith, we read about them in Hebrews 11, you know, the most valuable players. We read about them there in Hebrews 11, and they're cheering us on. You know, we're compassed to God. We're so great a cloud of witnesses. Then he says, looking unto Jesus. The greatest person cheering you on is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's for you. And He says, hey, come on, just follow me. Just go a little further. You can make this. You got this through me, He says. God's for you. God wants to bless you. Maybe not like the charismatics with prosperity. Maybe not always with these physical things. But God wants to bless you spiritually. And you'll notice uh, God did bless Joseph. He blessed his actions. I mean, here he is. He's serving. It seems like he's got the Midas touch. Everything he touched turns to gold. God blesses Joseph. He blesses Joseph's attitude. You know, Joseph could have been bitter. He had been betrayed by his own family, his own brothers. He had been sold. He had been betrayed. He could have been bitter. He had these dreams. He thought he knew what God wanted for his life and it didn't turn out that way. Can I go ahead and say this to you young people? Your life's not always going to turn out like you envision it. You see, have that little white picket fence and you got your little family and you got your nice little husband, your nice little wife, your nice little kids, your nice little dog and maybe a little gerbil. Life doesn't always turn out that way. Sometimes you have tragedies in life. Sometimes loved ones die unexpectedly. Sometimes things happen and there's betrayal by people that you love and care about. You know, churches aren't perfect. Pastors mess up. Church leaders messed up. Deacons mess up. Good church people fall out of church. All kind of things happen. And if you're not careful, you'll get bitter with that thing. And God's watching your attitude. And if your attitude's right and you stay close to Him, God is going to bless you. But, the, but the, here's the problem. God might be for you, but the devil's always against you. 
He's always going to be on your heels. He's watching you. He can't read your mind, I don't believe, but He can see everything you do. He sees what you look at online. You know they do that stuff nowadays. You look at something online, then they'll send you these advertisements because they know what you're looking at. The devil watches what you talk about, what you, what you say. He might not know what you think, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So then he says, oh, he says that. Oh, he's been looking over here. Oh, she's been hanging around this group. You know, maybe I can use this person. Maybe I can use this temptation to allure their flesh. God may be for you, but the devil's against you. You know, the devil tempted Joseph's appetite. But notice how he waited till Joseph was a big shot. There was no woman down in the well, the old well that they threw him down in. There wasn't a woman down there. There wasn't a woman out there in the field when he went to Dothan to seek for his brothers. No woman out there. No woman when he was growing up 17 years in his father's house. Everything was great. It's only at this point the devil pulls out the big guns. It's at this point that Satan begins to attack him just like this, with the lust of the flesh. The timing is very important. The talents. Think about this. You want to be real careful. And I got this from Dr. Peacock said this. Be careful that your talents don't take you where your character can't keep you. Be careful that your talents don't take you where your character can't keep you. You see, I believe Joseph had developed through time, all the way up to this point, a closeness to God. He had developed some patterns like we preached about last year where he was already in the habit of being close to God, doing the right thing, making the right decisions like Daniel did last night and he was early on saying, hey, I'm going to say no to the world and yes to God. I've already made up my mind. This is my path. I'm going to define my life backwards. I'm going to look at where I want to be first and that is close to God and now as I make my decision, I'm going to work backwards. We have to define our life by the judgment seat of Christ. I want to please Him. So anything that gets in the way of pleasing Him is to be cast aside. Anything that tempts me to go against pleasing Him, I'm to fight against. And so Joseph, I believe, early on had made that so his talents were there. He was on top, but he was able to deal with this. The devil knows who what to use. I don't know if the woman was pretty or not. I just want to say that she was probably pretty. The devil's going to always take sin and wrap it up in a real attractive package. You know, if you see the signs when you go down the road, you only see one side of the billboard. You see the guys, they're up there partying, and they got a six-pack. They got all these muscles, and they're holding a big thing of beer, you know, and here's all the ladies, they're dressed in a bad way. But, you know, they have all their teeth. You know, they have nice complexion, nice hairdos. They don't show you the other side of the billboard. The other side of the billboard, they don't have all their teeth. They have these sores and stuff all over them. They have these diseases that they've contracted by being with too many people and diseases from drugs. And they have people that have died. Some of them are in jail cells because they committed crimes while under the influence. They don't show you the other side of the billboard. I believe this lady, she was probably attractive. She had money. She might have even had to have some face work done or something, you know. I don't know. She might have had a face originally that would make an undertaker cry. I don't know. But she was probably pretty. Malcolm Mug- Muggeridge, he was a, a journalist back in the day, 1900s. He died, uh, born in early uh, 1909, died in 1990. He was a journalist. He was an editor. And he was uh, doing some correspondence work in India. And he was not a believer at this time. He didn't get converted to Christianity until later on in his life. But he was in India on, uh, on, on work. And he was at a place where they had this nice river. And he thought, you know, I'm going to go out here in the evening. I'm going to take a little swim and kind of cool off. And, and he got in that water and he began to you know, swim around. And he noticed across the, the river there was a very beautiful woman bathing herself. And all of a sudden, his heart just began to beat, and he was a married man, and he had had some impulses like this before, but he had always sequestered them because he was a married man. But at this point, his heart just went away with him, and his desire, he began to swim over toward this woman. And in his mind, he began to think about those stolen waters and how sweet they are, and the fantasies and so forth. And as he swam over there, and the closer and closer he got, his heart kept beating more and more. And as he came up out of the water closer, she turned around, and he face of a toothless 
leprous woman bathing herself. And he just stopped in disgust and in horror and he's thinking, oh my goodness, what a dirty woman. And then his heart smote him and something seemed to say, oh my goodness, what a dirty man. See, that's sin. Sin's all painted up and from a distance it looks good. The people that are successful, they look happy. The kids running around doing the bad things, they look like they're having a good time. But if you could only see them like they really are, you would see sin like it really is. And so she's very pretty. I believe she's very provocative. You say, why do you say that? Look in verse 7. She speaks to Joseph. Now, I know she was in authority and she was technically his master's wife, but for her to approach a man, especially in this day and age, that's very, that's very forward. And for her to say this, she's very provocative in doing this. You know, the devil, he, he has no shame at all. He will put sin right in your face. Now, he may do it in a sly manner based on where you are, but he will keep coming after you. And that's the second thing. Notice in verse 10, she's very persistent came to pass as she spake to Joseph. Look at that. Day by day. This wasn't a one-time thing. She did little things. She probably left him little notes. She might have left him some extra dessert on his plate, you know, or she might have cooked him some extra things and said, oh, just from me to you. See, what she tried to do more than just her looks, she tried to lure him maybe with emotions and desires and maybe companionship. There's no telling what's behind in between the words here. But she's very persistent, and so is the devil. The devil won't give up. What does it say about Christ? The Bible says that it was 40 days and he fasted, and it's at that point the devil comes to him. You see, what the devil's going to do, he's a lion, and what those lions do is they go about seeking whom he may devour, but the lions, if you ever watch some of those shows in Africa and stuff, they'll find the weakest zebra or the weakest uh, animal in the herd or the babies and they'll get them first. So what the devil will do with you is he'll come day by day, and it may be a day that you didn't pray. It may be a day you didn't put on all your armor. Maybe you left your shield of faith at home. Maybe you didn't put on the helmet of salvation that morning, or you forgot your sword. How are you going to fight if you don't have your sword? And he comes in a time day by day, very persistent. And that's what she did. She's trying to find a day when he's weak. He's out there sitting on the swing. He got all done with his duties. Maybe she should come sit beside him. He'd get up and go in the house. And he just kept avoiding her. And so you want to make sure you understand how this world is persistent. I need to say something here about us as Bible believers. I like to understand what's going on in the world, but we have to be careful. Because we can be worldly even though we're not of the world. By that I mean I know that we critique things that are in the world and yeah, we need to know some things that are going on so we can be circumspect, but we have to be careful. The Bible says be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning evil. You don't have to go down into a sewer to know it's dirty. You don't have to research all the evil in the world to know that it's bad. If the preacher says stay away from it, just trust him. How come it's only the preachers that have to stay away from this? Are they just the weak Christians? Why don't you just follow their example? Find somebody that's more godly than you are and say, let me find out what they're staying away from and maybe I should stay away from it. You don't have to go and research all this kind of stuff. And sometimes I believe we traffic in trash. Somebody said statistically, if you took social media, 90% of it is gossip. So take that and do what you want to. The Bible preaches against gossip. You just got to check out what's going on. I just want to be in the know. Isn't that what the devil told Eve? Don't you want to know some things? No harm in knowing it, but you're not going to do it. But you can check out who else is doing it. Let's be careful of that. The devil, day by day, he just keeps coming on. Years ago, it was the radio. Oh man, radio came out and preachers were like, hey man, quit listening to that thing. You don't need to be listening to the shadow. The Long Ranger. Grand Old Opry on Saturday nights. You know what you had? You had Sunday school teachers that should have been looking over their lesson on Saturday, but then they were listening to Grand Old Opry. And then the glass toilet came in, the television. 
That just preacher started preaching on that. The newspapers. You know, they used to have newspapers that came out in the morning and the evening. And the people couldn't wait to get them in the morning to see what was going on. They couldn't wait to get them in the evening. They'd read their newspapers more than the Bible. Then they came out with this thing called the Internet. People get on it all the time. Now you just carry it around with you. It's one thing, it's one device after the other. And the Bible says we need to watch out for the devices of the devil. He's got a device. And day by day, just like this woman, she came tempting him. And he's not going to let up. The temptation of this flesh, your flesh, is going to be tempted, listen to me, until you die or the rapture happens. Now the temptation may change. Someone gets older and they're 90 or 100 years old, they may not be tempted to go down to the local bar, but they can be tempted with some other stuff. So we better be careful with this. I want you to notice the second thing. The second thing, God's for you, the devil's against you. Here's Joseph. What a great example. This is really the title of the message, not run, don't resist. That's the point. Run, don't resist. The title of the message is that Joseph had the courage to run. There's the paradox. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna live a resurrected life, you've got to go to the cross first. Right? You want to have a Patmos experience, you've got to be exiled. You want to go up, you've got to go down. You want to gain your life, you've got to lose it. So here the idea is, if you want to say no to the world and yes to God, you've got to have the courage to run. Sounds like a paradox. Here Joseph, he, 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 he chose to run instead of resisting. Now let's look at the steps right here. Look at the steps right here. Verse number 8. The Bible says he refused. So first off, he's presented with this and he refuses there's no questioning in here. There's no debate. There's no deliberating. There's no decision at this point. He simply refuses. No. Everybody repeat after me. No. 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 Sounds rude, don't it? No. no. We need to learn to say no. The world's always just, you know, just, why don't you say, why don't you just say not now? No. No. He refused. You know, the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 The Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee also youthful lusts. He refused. Notice verses 8 and 9. Notice that he responded. Okay, so he refuses. And what does she say? And, and they go back and forth. Notice in verse number 8. He says, Behold, my master wotteth not what was in me in the house. He hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in the house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Notice he responded, first of all, logically. This is stupid. It's stupid. You belong to somebody else. You're somebody else's wife. He responded logically. My master entrusted me with everything. Everything's under my authority but you. You're under his authority. You're not mine. Number two, he responded morally. It's wrong. Period. And you know, even the world has a sense of right and wrong. You know, there are young brides and they get married to their husbands. They don't want their husbands cheating on them. Maybe out in the world. There are guys, they marry their wife and they don't want their wife cheating on them. They have some sense of values and some sense of morals. They don't want somebody to come over and murder their husband or wife or come in and murder their kids. They believe some things are wrong. The Bible gives us the morals in the Scriptures because it goes all the way back to God. And that brings me to number three, not just logically and morally, but biblically. He responds biblically. You need to know the Bible not so you can be a scholar. We're not scholars. Nobody in here is a scholar. We're students. There's a difference than a scholar and a student. A scholar says, I've attained. I am somebody. A student says, I'm still learning. We're students of the Bible. You don't just need to learn stuff so your head keeps swelling up. Your head gets so big you can't even walk out the door. You need to answer biblically so you can answer according to what God wants you to do. Notice he doesn't say, I will not, although he shouldn't. You know, that's true. He says, I cannot. That's that Daniel coming through again. I've already made up a decision. I cannot do this thing. This is against not just what I do. This is against who I am. 
When you serve Jesus Christ and make those decisions to do the right things, what you do becomes who you are. It's not that I do Christian things. It is I am a Christian, therefore I do these things. you got to get the thing right or you'll become a Pharisee. If you, don't get the car, if you get the cart before the horse, you will become a Pharisee and you only do certain things to appear outwardly. I'm a Christian. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Some things you just don't do because you're a believer. Period. We got this idea that we're in the church age, we're saved by grace through faith and there's no works attached that we shouldn't have certain good works. We've got this idea that we can just live any way we want to live because we can always just put it under the blood. All we got to do is just put it under the blood, right? Thank God for the blood. But you got to watch out. Yeah. Just like the old man, when his grandson would do something wrong, he'd take him out to this fence post. And every time he'd do something wrong, he'd have him nail that nail in the oh, fence wow. post. He'd get it right, he'd confess it, he'd do the chores, whatever he had to do. They'd go out and pull the nail out. He said, okay, I've forgiven you, you've made restitution, but look at the post. Yeah, see? You've got holes yes. in it. Right. The things you do will come back. Thank God we have eternal life. I'm glad I have salvation and I have everlasting life. I've got eternal life. I've got that fixed. But what about life for right here and now? He delivered us from this present evil world. And so it's not just something out there. We're supposed to live right here. And so in the context, when you think about Him, He runs, He does not resist. Notice He refuses, He responds and he removes. He avoids her. Like I said, she came several times. I don't know how many times, but he made himself sure he got out of town. You cannot stop sin. Like the old uh, Martin Luther, I believe, one of the old preachers says, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your, in your head. People all around you, you go to public school, you go to public jobs, places that you cannot get away from the wickedness. But you know what? Even these phones have an off button. You don't have to listen to it. You can do all things through Christ. Man, you can get a loan, you can turn everything off, and you can read the Bible just like they did back in the days of the apostles. You don't have to do this stuff. We done bought into this idea that we have to please the flesh. We've bought into this American idea. And you're Americans. Well, I'm Asian, I'm this. No, you're an American. Amen. Now, I'm a Southern American. We're Americans, and we've bought into this idea that we are our bodies. Yeah, that's right. That's our mentality. No, you're inside your body. The real you's on the inside. And thank God He gave us a body. We can eat and everything. But it's not all about the body. No. So what? You got to sweat a little bit. You'll get over it. Some of you are looking around, you see all the all this stuff. You're like, what is all this? What is all this? It's called, uh, pre- uh, what's it called? Perspiration? Perspiration? It's called sweat. You're on the inside. The flesh, the appetites of the flesh are not to control you. This point is so important. He has the courage to run because you've got to get this. You've got to understand. The Bible says in verse number 12 that he left his garment and he fled. The Bible says, I quoted it earlier, 2 Timothy 2.22, Flee also youthful lust. James chapter 1. Turn over there. I want you to see this. You've got to get this. James chapter 1. I mentioned it, I believe, a little bit yesterday. James chapter 1. Right after Hebrews, James, chapter 1. So, preacher, I'm a fighter, I'm a soldier, I'm going to resist, I'm going to stand. Bear with me, hold on a second. You're going at this thing backwards. We're not talking about the soldier at this point. You've got to understand some things. Yeah, you've got to stand, having done all to stand. But look in James chapter 1, verse number 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Okay? The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, but the Spirit did not tempt Jesus. The devil tempted him. God's not going to tempt you to do wrong. God's going to try to encourage you to do right. 
He wants you to do well. He wants to be proud of you at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. But the devil's there. Notice in verse number 13, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. If you start resisting sin, you've gotten too close to it. You're too close. He had to get away from it. Flee useful. You just need to be away from it. Well, I, th I think I can handle it. You know, I'm not going to gossip, you know. Yeah, but somebody else is. I, th I think I can handle it. You know, I only got a few curse words. You know, I only have a little bit of nudity. You know, I think I can handle it. You can't handle it. You cannot handle it. You have, you are Adam, I am Adam. The word Adam is the same word for man. We come from that same seed and here we are. And this appetite right here, it will fall. It will fail. You cannot resist it. That's like taking Timothy, Timmy up here and trying to say, okay, you and Brother Chris are going to arm wrestle. And I really think you stand a chance. It's pretty tough. I saw that side. You can't resist. You will fall. You have to avoid. Downtime is dangerous time. An idle mind's the devil's workshop. You've got to be real careful. You have to do what we said. You've got to plan. You've got to purpose. You've got to prepare before it ever happens. Joseph had already made up his mind, I believe, early on that he was going to please God. When something came in his path that said, hey, come here, he's like, nope. Well, he, surely he should have tried soul winning. He could have led her to Christ. <laughs> what, really, why are you across from the queer bars? You really think you're going to lead them to Christ? <laughs> just, just avoid. What does he say? Avoid it, pass not by it, turn away. Some things you don't need to be around. So why? Because with the tenacity of a pit bull, I need to protect my fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. You, ain't, you might not be strong enough to do certain things. And so I think the problem is we get this mentality that we can charge hell with a squirt gun, but you can't handle it. Only Jesus Christ on the inside can handle the devil. You can't handle it. Even Michael the archangel couldn't handle the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. All right, the Bible says resist the devil, but the Bible never says resist sin. It says abstain from all appearance of evil. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Flee youthful lust. Joseph got out of Dodge. You better get away from it. Diabetics, they have trouble with sugar problems, right? So when they're presented with chocolate cake and all these kind of things, the best thing for them to do is not to look at it. Because you start looking at it and you see everybody else eating it, you're going to want to eat it. I can just dip my finger. Let me just let me get a little taste. Oh, yeah. Ooh, that sure is good. Let me get another little taste. Have you ever eaten one Lay's potato chip? Not possible. Can't do it. You eat one, you can eat two, and then the whole bag. Amen. Forget it. All right, so run, don't resist. And then finally, I want to say this back in, in Genesis 39. He left, and as soon as he left, you know what she began to do. She began to manipulate things. You have her revenge. Okay, so what we have with the last point I want you to see is we have being right is more important than your reputation. You young people, you really have to deal with this because I know you're all influenced by your peers, kind of like Herod was. Remember how Herod was influenced by all the people around him? He liked John the Baptist. He liked to hear him preach, but he had all that pressure from everywhere, and then he caved in. And so if you're not careful, you're going to be more concerned with your reputation than doing right. And here, Joseph didn't care about his reputation. All he cared about is, i got to get away from this woman. She's going to cause me to sin against God and break my fellowship with God. 
and it's wrong, it's not right morally, it's not right logically, it's not right biblically, i got to get out of here. So he runs, he doesn't resist, he gets out of there, and then she begins to have revenge. Verses 13 to 18, she grabs a hold of his garment, and she tells the servants, look what happened, this guy came in, he started, he took his coat off, and all this kind of stuff, he started making advances to me, and she makes up all this stuff. Her husband comes home, she lets into him, says, what did you do? Bring this Hebrew over here. He began to mock me, and he began to make passes at me he begins she starts lying the revenge of the woman the response of the husband you can't help you can't blame him then you have the reward from the Lord look in verses 21 to 23 you say what's the reward God puts him in jail what that's the reward God separates him for good from that woman I imagine, I don't know how many days or weeks were going by, he's probably thinking, how do I get out of this? He's thinking, you know, I really love my job. I like what I do. I'm enjoying it. I'm blessed. I love my master. He's a good man. I like all the people working for me. But this woman, man, this Jezebel, this Delilah, this wicked woman, how do I get away from her? Man, he's going and going. And he has to get, and the Lord says, I'll answer your prayer. I bet he prayed, God, please work it out where I don't see her today. God said, I'm going to work it out where you don't ever see her again. But it wasn't how Joseph thought it was going to be. See, if you really love God and you really get close to God and you want it more than anything to be close to God, the Lord will answer that prayer. But He might not always answer it the way you want Him to answer it. you got to think backwards again. The, my goal is my relationship to Jesus. My goal is to do well in the judgment seat of Christ. Anything that gets in that way, God, take it out of the way. God, help me to learn how to handle it, learn how to deal with it, learn how to, res to run from it and, and to handle that. And so being right is better than having a reputation. God gave him his reward. Just do right day by day. You know what will happen? You'll be in the right place because he wound up in jail. You know chapter 40. Chapter 40, the butler and the baker are there and they have their dreams and Joseph's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that calling. The Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And they start telling their dream, and he's like, you know, God gave me the ability to interpret this dream. Do not interpretations belong to God? And they begin to tell the dream, and he interprets it. Then they go up there, and all of a sudden everything happens, and the butler gets out, he gets restored. And then Joseph thinks, man, finally I'm going to get out of this dungeon. The Lord says, not quite. Two more years. And the butler forgets. And then it just so happens, Pharaoh's got to have a dream. And then the butler like, bing, Lord, I forgot. Master, I forgot. There's a man down in the dungeon. Joseph, he interpreted dreams. Go get him. And then all the dreams that Joseph had way back in the past about his brothers coming and him being a ruler and all those things, all those dreams came to fruition. God put him in the right place at the right time because he made a decision to do right. Amen. Even though everybody else thought he did wrong. All the people that looked up to him heard all the gossip. And I guarantee you some of them believed it. Some of them might not have believed it. But you know what? You know, people say, yeah, I believe that. You know what could happen? All your friends could all of a sudden post all this stuff against you. And all the people you think are your friends, they believe all the garbage. Why don't you just go ahead and say, I don't need them. I don't need the world. I've got Jesus. I don't need these friends. i got fellowship with church friends. These are your real friends right here. And so being right is more important than your reputation. You got to get, especially in this day and age, you got to get past that. Well, maybe in conclusion, last night, maybe you made a decision. You were resolved to say no to the world. But maybe you need the courage to run from some things. You can't handle it. It takes courage to say, that's above my pay grade. You know, as a pastor, there are some things I can't do. If I have some people that are dealing with psychological issues that deal with medical field, I have to say, that's above my pay grade. I, I'm not a doctor. You need to see a medical professional. My profession or my expertise, if you want to call it that, is the Bible. I'm a minister of the Bible, the Word of God, that deals with the spiritual things. There's some things you want to ask me about maybe you know, how to... Um, build a house from the bottom up. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a journeyman. I'm not a, a construction architect. None of that. That's, that's not me. That's above my grade. That's outside of my sphere. 
Some of you in your Christian life, you need to understand you have these appetites that the devil wants to take advantage of. The lust of the flesh is a huge one, especially in our age now because everything's visual. Yes. And he's going to use this to go after that. And he stimulates this with that. They're all connected. And the end goal is to get, get you here where you'll wind up doing that. The people that get further and further in sin, the further and further they are away from what God intended them to do, they raise themselves up higher and higher, and now we have more people than ever that are killing themselves. Christian people even, killing themselves because they didn't watch this. So you said, preacher, I said no to the world, okay? You said yes to God. What about having the courage to run? Put some stuff down saying, okay, I, gotta, I, I can't be around this. You know, somebody says, hey, I want you to come over. We're having some friends over having a party. Okay, what kind of party? Well, you know, we're just going to pop a few tops. I'm sorry, Jesus isn't invited. I can't be around that. I'm not going to be around that. So, well, you can go there and you can be a witness. I can be a witness by saying, hey, you need to get saved. See you later. I'm not going to be there. Well, you know, when you would, don't you think Jesus would go in the bar and sit down with them? No. No, I don't. I think He'd be on the outside of the place. Saying, hey... Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden. Don't go in there. Come out here. You think you can just be around all that stuff and it not affect you? You have to be around it enough by just having to go to school, having to go to work. Good night. Some of you are inviting this stuff into your life. You're saying, hey, Jezebel, come here. Hey, Delilah. Hey, Potiphar's wife. I'd sure like for you to be my friend. I really look up to you. You're my favorite, favorite actor. That shouldn't be your role model. These sports figures out here, they're wicked people. Yeah, I really feel sorry for these actors and these sports celebrities because they have all this money dumped on them. Their talents have taken them further than their characters ready for them to go. And they can't handle it. They go off the deep end and everybody else follows them just like sheep. Just follow them to the slaughter. God says you don't need to follow them people. You need to have the courage to turn around and run. I'll, I'll close with this illustration about lions. There was a lion tamer, and he was real good at the zoo. He was one of the best, and he fed the lions, and he'd get real cozy with them, and he, he could feed those lions right out of his hand. And they knew him, and they'd purr, and he'd pat them on the head, and he'd feed them right out of his hand. Well, one day, he was a little bit careless. There were certain precautions you got to do when you go in to feed the lions, and he'd forgotten to notice that he had a scratch on the back of his hand that was bleeding. And he went into that lion... And that lion got a whiff of that blood. Instead of just going for the meat, the lion went for him. It doesn't matter how long. If that lion had been without food a long time, you know, lions can go a long time without food. It doesn't matter. That appetite is still there. And it gets one little whiff of blood, it's coming after you. The best thing to do is don't go in the cage with the lion. Just run. Have the courage to run. We don't, need, we don't need casualties that are trying to stand out there and supposedly fight against this stuff. Yeah. You're just going to be a casualty. You're going to be like um, you ever see a Mesa over there in the Bible whenever he takes over from Joab and he's not ready for the position and he gets out there and his sword don't even fit. He winds up getting killed. It's a casualty. Not ready for it. And you need to grow and you need to mature and you don't need to be resisting and getting too close to this sin. You need to get out of there. Amen.